Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington. I'm joined once again by Samuel Burke and, of course, Jack Farley. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Big story of the day. Risk on, way on. Equities up across the board. More on that later. Jack Farley, what are you looking at today? What's on your radar? Well, Ash, I'm looking at Bitcoin. It took a tumble today, down as much as 11% for the day to $32,500, dragging Ethereum and much of the crypto world with it. Samuel, what are you looking at? Jack, all weekend long, I've been following American Airlines as they've been canceling hundreds of flights due to maintenance issues, but also staffing problems. They're not the only airline facing this, and we're going to be looking at what it can tell us about labor inflation. Ash? Yeah, so back to our top story today. Everything is rising across the board right now in U.S. equity markets. 95% of the S&P 500 stocks are up today. Uh, Just to give you a sense of a context for how broad-based this rally that we're seeing is right now, let's run through the closing numbers here. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average up 1.76% on the day, uh, settling down at 33,876. S&P 500 up one spot, 4%, uh, closing at 4,224. NASDAQ up 14,000, NASDAQ up closing at 14,141. That's up uh, roughly 0.8% on the day. And the big gainer, the Russell 2000 small cap index closing at 2,286, up 2.16% over 2% on the day. You know, basically anything out there that is sensitive to economic growth is catching a bid in this environment. Uh, It's a truly uh, interesting day to see this rally. Uh, Guys, what are you thinking about this? I know you're watching equities as well. Um, Yeah, if if I may, Ash, I actually think we have a few charts uh, to that point. So as you said, the Russell 2000, the small cap stock in this is absolutely exploding. Um, And it was really the industrials, the energy stocks, the cyclical stocks that are leading the way. And the NASDAQ is still up, but but on the back foot relative to other places. And then you look at the different sectors, you'll see that energy absolutely exploded higher. I believe the XLE ended up over 4% for the day. You really don't see that every day. And and, um, uh, you look at just which stocks are leading the charge. Um, It is those energy stocks. Marathon Oil up 7%. Hess up 7%. Devon Energy, Halliburton. Um, So the energy is really leading the way. You said a total total reversal from uh, the price action of of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then you look at the laggards. Which stocks are down in the S&P? Which are the 5% ash? You you said uh, 95% are up. Which are the 5% that are down? Well, it's really a who's who among the tech sector. It's Netflix. It's Amazon, uh, it's NVIDIA and the like. Uh, Samuel, what are you looking at? Well, it's really the tech stocks for me. You know, I follow tech for years. And so two things really stand out for me when I look at the tech scene. Netflix announces this huge deal with Steven Spielberg studio, and yet they're still down. And then you look at Amazon today, it's Amazon Prime Day across the next two days. And even with that, they couldn't get any momentum from that. A lot of that has to do with shipping charges that are going to be a lot heavier from China. And so I think at the end of the day, I'm really still looking at what the players are saying and how it doesn't seem to be affecting the markets. I mean, you have former Treasury Secretary uh, Larry San, uh, Larry Summers, rather, talking about how he actually thinks the Fed is doing the right thing by, by doing what they've done, by giving the indicators that they've done. But they really need to step back and take a much more serious view about how they got it so wrong. How did they get the forecast so dramatically wrong? And so when you have voices like that, and Ray Dalio talking about this knock-on effect, that the economy is going to feel as a result of what's happening in the markets, I would say that a lot of people are looking even more hawkish than last week. And yet, in spite of that, here we are today, Dow up over 500 points. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, James Bullard out today uh, with comments suggesting that we may see a rate increase in 2022 because economic activity is picking up uh, so strongly. I had to chuckle when uh, Jack said NASDAQ on the back foot. Today, NASDAQ on the back foot means it's up almost eight tenths of 1% on the day. But as you point out, Jack, uh, relative to what we're seeing on uh, the Russell 2000, even the Dow uh, with these uh, cyclicals, uh, industrial stocks, where you see that, the smaller cap stocks, uh, rallying at a much greater pace uh, certainly looks on the back foot today. 
I have to say, one other thing, a little bit of a deeper dive uh, on U.S. equities that I'm watching that I thought was really interesting. There's a new note out, a uh, research note out from UBS, uh, and basically the note concludes the following. If the Fed withdraws its yearly $1.4 trillion in quantitative easing spending, uh, which is certainly the rate path to normalization that we seem to be on, the path to normalization we seem to be on with the balance sheet, uh, S&P earnings, earnings would decline 3% based on this UBS projection. Now, this is significant and interesting because the blended earnings projection uh, for the S&P 500 analyst consensus is 10% per annum over the next two years, so more than 20% in aggregate on a compounded basis. This is absolutely very significant to see uh, a report that suggests that the earnings growth is going to be so dramatic. And remember, if you think about stocks in the most elemental or fundamental level, what you're pricing is future earnings growth. It's kind of the definition of what uh, a stock valuation is if you look in uh, in the finance textbooks. So to me, this is really interesting seeing where we are with this path to normalization, seeing this rally today. I'm curious, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Samuel, you want? Well, no, I mean, for me, it, uh, one, I would like to know, was that report concluded before the Fed made their comments? But I mean, it does get back to this bigger picture that in the bigger picture, you know, what the Fed did last week is about the short to medium term. And obviously, it's taking a much broader view, though I doubt that that was moving markets. But again, how much are they taking into account the inflation that we could see in the short to medium and possibly long term? And if you're listening to people like Larry Summers, you know, how much is that a factor given that there's no yeah. consensus about where we are, whether this is transitory or not, this inflation that we're experiencing, Jack? Uh, Ash, that's really interesting. I think that so much of the stock appreciation, the increase in the S&P 500 has been rising analyst expectations, which have risen as earnings have actually materialized. I remember from the first quarter of 2020, you know, Apple had something like a, a uh, you know, hundreds of billions of, uh, of revenue and, and, and profit, and it really was off the charts. Um, I, I wonder what the mechanism exactly is for a reduction in quantitative easing to, to how that will um, impact the earnings. But it, it is an interesting report. Yeah, I, I think it's about runoff on the balance sheet and the absence uh, or the tapering down of incremental new purchases uh, on the, uh, on the uh, U.S. Treasury side as well as the agency debt side. Yes. Well, Ash, speaking of Treasuries, we had some pretty uh, intense action today going into last night at 11 p.m., uh, going into midnight, uh, yields were sharply falling. The 30-year actually going below 2%, which is a key level. Um, but since then, they've rallied about 15 basis points. So you had a pretty epic reversal. And the 30-year uh, the is now standing at about 2.1%. And I think that you can directly link that to the surge in energy uh, prices and, and energy stocks, as well as technology stocks being on the back foot relatively. So I think it, it really is all about duration. Yeah, and we should also probably point out uh, WTI trading at uh, 73 spot 54 here today, uh, obviously, obviously rising. If you look at that chart, uh, it's just been up and to the right. Uh, consistently since effectively November. Obviously, there was a little bit of a bulge uh, in March. It tapered off a little bit. But what we're looking at here, the rise in WTI, uh, basically since May, uh, up at a 45 degree angle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Samuel. No, it's just incredible the whiplash when you look at it from oil to the dollar to markets. When I woke up this morning here in London looking at what had happened in Asia, thinking that might be how the day would go, and everything from, from stocks to oil to the dollar, just in the course, not even of 24 hours, how much it changed in the course of 12 hours. Yeah, DXY backing off a little bit here, uh, below the 92 level now, trading at 91 spot 86. Yes, actually, I'm uh, putting up a chart of that right now. You can see that the dollar weakened a little bit as yields rose. And that proved to be a fertile ground for the commodity rally, which, as you mentioned, Ash, earlier, uh, WTI crude oil now standing above 73. That must be a, a absolute high for the year. I'm almost positive it is. Um, and then earlier to what Samuel was alluding, the Asia opened very weak with the Hang Seng, the Australian stock indices 
up, uh, excuse me, down a, a little over at one percent. And Nikkei, the Japanese Nikkei two twenty five, was down a whopping three point three percent. So um, yeah, we we saw Asia bleed early in the morning, but uh, fortunately in U.S. markets, it's a risk on appetite. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is. Uh... That is a, a high on the year uh, or thereabouts, maybe some intraday, but close to a high on the year on the close. Uh, and uh, precisely uh, to that point, for people who don't know, uh, by the way, that uh, one of the reasons why you see an oil and other commodities rallying on dollar weakness is because oil, of course, is denominated in US dollars. Uh, and so when you see the US dollar falling, DXY in this case, uh, and other cross currency pairs, it's logical and reasonable to expect to see that oil is going to rally at the same time. Yes, Ash, um, perhaps should we move on to assets that did not go up today, but actually had a tremendous tumble? Of course, I'm talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, yeah. and much of the crypto universe. So um, I have been studying the charts. I've been looking at the price action. Samuel, you, I believe, um, you know, have been taking a look at what's actually going on with China. And then Ash, of course, you are the generalist crypto, you know, crypto editor of Real Vision, the expert. So um, crypto, excuse me, Bitcoin, declined um, from about 36,000 earlier today to 32.5. And that by itself, it's down about 40% over the past two months and down just uh, just about 50%, over almost half since uh, its highs uh, when it was at 64,000. So if this were yeah. a stock market, it would easily be in a deep bear market. Um, but Hey, Jack, yeah. can I jump in on that, on price? Because yeah. I think it, you, you raised some really important points there. And, and just for a little bit of context, and just to show how incredibly volatile this asset is. So Bitcoin, I'm looking right now, I've got a, a spreadsheet that I built uh, over the weekend that's showing this across different time horizons. This is really striking. So Bitcoin is off about 9.3% on the day. Uh, week uh, to date, it's off 8 Percent one month uh, off about eight percent year to date year to date up twelve percent one year to date percent change up two hundred and fifty percent now. When you see those different uh, time horizons moving in different directions with the different percent returns, you know, pretty striking. You don't see that in other asset classes, and that's just a function of the wild mood swings that we've seen uh, in the Bitcoin market. It's a feature of the asset class. And and today's news is really being driven by one story, and that's the fact that China is clamping down on Bitcoin mining in certain regions. And so they're worried that some of these places will close up shop and flood the market with the Bitcoins that they do have. And that, of course, has a knock-on effect for Ethereum. But I think at the end of the day, your point is 100% valid here. This is a one-day story. And as we've reported on in the past, what could be bad for Chinese Bitcoin miners might be great for American Bitcoin miners. Maybe they'll flood the market temporarily, but then this could mean other places will be able to pick up some of this work. So I think the big picture, which you're drilling down on there, Ash, is incredibly important. Probably a one-day story. Yes, but it's a one-day story, uh, I'd add, Samuel, not just for Bitcoin, but for Ethereum as well. I've got all the crypto uh, coins listed by market cap, and the top 20 are all down today. Binance coin down 11%, Ripple down 12%, Dogecoin down 28.5%. For a long time now, almost pretty much since its inception, the inter-asset correlation between the different crypto coins has been a mainstay of the crypto world. And today is, is proof, at least for the day, that that remains the case. Yeah, it's trading like a risk off crypto day, isn't it? Um, you know, look, to just add, by the way, Samuel, I agree with everything you said, uh, very well said as well. I would say uh, to drill down a little bit here into the context, what's happening is obviously China has been imposing significant limitations uh, on particularly mining, as you said, uh, but also trading of these assets for uh, allegedly macro prudential reasons, is the stated reason. Um, PBOC, the, the specific driver of today's price action uh, and in the consternation that we're seeing in these markets, the specific driver uh, is this language coming out of the PBOC, that's the People's Bank of China, this is the Chinese, uh, the Chinese Central Bank. Uh, and the, the, the wording was, or at least the language that we've gotten in the translation in English, is that banks need to, quote, strictly limit, close quote, strictly limit uh, their um, 
their involvement with this, and they need to strictly adhere to the guidance the Chinese central bank has provided. Now, this is true across the massive state-owned uh, commercial banks in China, uh, and also places like Ant Financial's Alipay. So, this is a very broad-based bit of guidance. We know here in the United States, if you're a bank and your regulator uh, tells you that you need to do something and that you need to strictly adhere to policy guidance, they probably mean that seriously. And so, what we're seeing in the price action is perhaps, perhaps, uh, some of the backdraft coming off that PBOC guidance. And it's interesting to see governments around the world really get nervous here in Europe today, or I should say the EU. We're not in the EU anymore here in the UK. What we saw is actually the EU coming out with a, a digital version of the euro. Now, it's not crypto, but it's this unease that so many bank, central banks around the world and so many governments around the world feel that they're losing control of their currency. They have control of the cash, but as crypto pushes more and more into their territory, they're feeling the need to step things up. Now, no matter what side of the debate you're on with crypto, you could say that's a positive, and certainly people have been moving away from cash. But doing a credit card transaction in euros is not the same as a digital euro. So we're really seeing incredible shifts around the world as a result of, of Bitcoin. Yeah. I should probably add on a technical factor here uh, in the price of Bitcoin. We saw a so-called death cross today. Uh, that's the 50-day moving average falling below the 200-day moving average. Obviously, a bearish sign uh, to see the more recent data trending below the 200 days, the longer-term average uh, now above the shorter-term average. Yes, Ash, we actually are looking at that chart now, and it is a key technical indicator. People believe that, so it would be chart negligence to, to not let people know of that. I will say, however, Ash, that um, you know, there, some people think that technical analysis is sort of drawing land, lines in the sand. And you know, for those people who the bullish signs didn't make them be bullish on Bitcoin on the way up, these, uh, this bearish sign shouldn't make them be a bear on the, on the way down. It's just something as a way I see of um, uh, describing historical price action rather than predicting future price action. Yeah, I would say um, you know two things. First, as we all know, even those who are most skeptical of uh, of technical analysis will say uh, that if you draw the line in the sand and enough people believe it has meaning, it does in fact have meaning. And I should also. Uh, Tease shameless plug, uh, the book I'm working on uh, that's about to be released with Harry Krishnan, uh, who's a gentleman who is much smarter than I am, uh, background as an academic mathematician. We reviewed uh, some data looking at positioning risk, and it suggests, it suggests that there are some additional factors uh, that could come into play that support technical analysis uh, from a fundamental perspective uh, in terms of understanding the positioning risk, credit risk, that key levels uh, in markets can play. So I'll just tease that a bit. Well, if you're going to tease it, you might as well give us the full tease. Any other details you can tell us about the book, Ash? Uh, coming, coming soon. And I believe we'll be talking more about it on the platform in the coming weeks. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just want to go back to the, the headline that I think is driving all of this. And it is the, the bigger picture in China, not just the clamping down on mining today. But as I was talking about those opportunities in the United States, I'm just curious, with all the work that you've done in crypto, Ash, where, what do, where do you think are the other places that can benefit if China is going to continue um, pushing uh, mining, crypto mining, out of China. Is the U.S. the main benefactor in, in your estimation, based on all the factors that you've seen in your reporting? It's such an interesting question. In fact, interestingly enough, I was actually talking to uh, someone uh, in the VC space on the West Coast today, uh, a few hours before this call, and we were talking about this. I said, uh, effectively, it benefits, I think, people in a couple of key geographies. Number one, anywhere where energy is cheap. Uh, and number two, places where the climate permits cooling of these massive ASIC rigs uh, that are used to actually do the mining. And I also said, I think that this could be potentially, potentially, uh, bullish for clean energy development uh, here in the United States. So what's interesting about Bitcoin is that uh, the mining aspect of it is that the mining basically, well, what's happened for Bitcoin mining uh, is what's just happened to all of us in the last 12 months. It's totally virtualized. It can geographically be distributed anywhere in the world. So 
you don't necessarily have to have power generation uh, near, uh, for example, population centers. We see this in places like Iceland that has uh, a lot of geothermal energy. There's a great deal of Bitcoin mining that's happening there. But if other renewables, solar, uh, wind, tidal energy can be harnessed for this, they can literally be anywhere in the world where you can have high-speed fiber optic connections uh, to the internet backbone that the miners can be connected to. So it's potentially something that we could see here in the United States. And I hope, and it's a, I think it's, it's something that I would, uh, I would definitely be looking for beyond just the sort of emotional hope uh, to see this potentially spurring uh, more clean energy development, renewable energy development, uh, carbon neutral energy development here in the United States. Obviously, U.S. is a world leader in technology, and hopefully we can get there. And well, certainly, a- it's certainly not the headline that's captured so much of the world. You know that I've been looking closely at El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as an official currency alongside the U.S. dollar. And so much of the, path, uh, the pushback that the president of El Salvador was getting from his own country was over the environmental concern. So I think the more that that view comes to light, Ash, it could change the discussion around crypto because some of the people who would be natural supporters are pushing back because of the environmental concerns. I've got a question I'd like to pose, which is, to what degree is this beneficial for people who mine Bitcoin who are not located in China? And I'm specifically talking about the profitability of the enterprise. For example, I had a a friend in college who, in his college dorm room, mined Bitcoin. Uh, Would he benefit from this? Would he see that? And obviously, mining Bitcoin can be a a very complicated and cost-intensive affair. Would this be good for someone like him? Would this perhaps be good for the stocks like uh, Marathon Digital Holdings, perhaps? I, I, I don't know, that sort of own Bitcoin mining rigs. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Unfortunately, the days of hobbyists being able to easily mine uh, Bitcoin on their desktop computers uh, are probably something that's a bit in the past now. Uh, these are being done with massive mining pools using ASICs. Those are the application-specific integrated circuit uh, cards that you see in these massive miners. I'm not really sure that hobbyists benefit uh, from this just because of the scale that's required to do this. But Am I showing my age, Ash? <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack, I missed that one more time. Oh, I said, am I showing my age by, by how old I am? I, yeah. <laughs> Jack, but, if you're showing your age, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but Ash, it must be those competitors, not the hobbyists, but the big competitors that you're talking about in places like Iceland must be rather happy today when you have such a huge competitor like China continuing to clamp down on the mining there. They must be celebrating, no? Yeah, I would think so, absolutely. And I should say, I haven't done a deep dive uh, into who those competitors are uh, and in terms of their relative uh, apportionment across the globe. But look, bottom line, uh, China has somewhere around 50% of the Bitcoin hash power for mining. Uh, when that is coming offline and is certainly appears to be doing, that's clearly good for everyone else elsewhere in the world who's in that space. Just a final point on crypto, Ash. I understand that tomorrow you have a piece coming out with um, Jim Bianco and uh, I forget the, the gentleman, the other gentleman, but it's sort of Jim, a Jimmy Song. Jimmy, Jimmy Song. Song. It's a it's a lively discussion between about De- uh, DeFi and Bitcoin. You tell tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so this is a conversation. It's a you know these are two uh, two guys who are obviously uh, longtime friends of Real Vision. Uh, Jimmy Song, who is uh, a Bitcoiner, uh, and Jim Bianco, who is someone who's coming to us uh, originally. He's been in a space in the capital market space, uh, macro investing space uh, for many years, many decades. Who's recently uh, gotten very interested in the DeFi space. Uh, so this is really like an intense clash of worldviews. The conversation gets a little spicy, but it's very substantive, because what you're seeing really is this this collision of different ways of seeing the world. As I've said uh, before, for people who aren't in the cryptocurrency space, I think the single largest schism uh, in the space isn't between uh, the people who are advocating cryptocurrency and the so-called no-coiners, uh, who are the who are the neo-Luddites who are opposed to cryptocurrency. Uh, it is the conversation, the debate, the near civil war within the space between the Bitcoiners uh, and everyone else. And this conversation, I think, is so powerful because you see uh, two people who really are really brilliant avatars of their side of the debate. Uh, Jimmy Song, I believe, wrote the O'Reilly's book on programming Bitcoin for those uh, non-nerds out there. Uh, O'Reilly is the publisher that does like the reference books uh, of 
choice for the really hardcore people in the space. Jimmy Song is about as deep as thinker on the technology as you're going to find. Jim Bianco, uh, on the other side of the coin, is about as deep a thinker as you're likely to find uh, in analyzing and thinking about broad-based capital markets. He's an independent shop. Uh, so unlike, for example, research that you would see out of a sell-side bank, uh, Jim Bianco is looking across asset classes, across currencies, across commodities, uh, equities, basically thinking about the world in a holistic way that you would very rarely see from sell-side research. So you have these two kind of titans in their space, and they absolutely collide uh, fundamentally because their worldviews, their perspectives, their understanding of what this revolution is about is so radically different. I think it's must-see. You're full of great teases today, Ash, but if it compares anything to your uh, pomp, Mike Green, the best Bitcoin debate ever, then it, will, it really will live up to all the hype that it's getting behind the scenes here at Real Vision. I think it has some shades of that, definitely. And I think that, you know, in some ways, it's a slightly more technical debate. It's a debate that's a little bit more focused uh, on financial markets rather than the broad sort of conceptual question of is this technology good or is it bad? Both debates, I think, are fantastic in their own way. Um, I think you really have to see this one to make up your own mind about which is better. We'll be watching. Watch it tomorrow. I think it goes live at midnight tonight. Is that right? Yeah, I think it does. So, Ash, you know, everyone talks about Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. With yeah. the rise in yields, it seems like people are maybe getting a little less certain um, that inflation is going to be transitory. But Samuel, I understand that you've been tracking a certain market which is very related to inflation. Um, tell us a little bit about the airline sector, which has been at the epicenter of these supply shocks that have seen tremendous price increases. Well, the headline is American Airline canceling hundreds of flights Saturday, Sunday, as well as today. Of course, I've got to fly to get back home to Arizona, so I'm always watching those American Airlines flights very closely. But listen, here's the deal. This is a perfect storm, insiders are telling me. You have a number of issues going on. You have maintenance of planes happening or not happening in this case, but you also have staffing issues. Basically, what happened, of course, the airlines had to lay off hundreds, actually thousands of workers, and they're rehiring them back little by little. They've had cheap prices, so lots of people are flying now, vaccinations are going well, and all of a sudden, they don't have enough staff, they don't have enough airplanes. You had pilots who were training on certain airplanes and on newer airplanes, and now there's actually been an imbalance. So that's all created this perfect storm, but it really gets to this tale of inflation. And so I just want to put up on the screen one of the comments that we have from inside one of the Facebook message groups among airline staff. And what we see from one woman saying, we are short agents, short flight crew. We've used all of our reserves, 90 ramp crew quit, and the new hires are quitting. 870 daily departures out of Dallas-Fort Worth. We cannot handle Every day is insane, and I mean that literally. I think sometimes these little reporting bits can give us an incredible snapshot into what's going on in a particular industry. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate this when we talk about inflation, but I think this does give us a window. Certainly, airlines are unique. They have to go through a big training process for their employees. It takes months to onboard even the calling agents that you speak with when you're uh, reserving a flight. A lot of people are overwhelming the airlines because people are trying to figure out what the COVID regulations are. They're very complex, state to state, uh, country to country, as I know all too well, trying to fly from the UK to the US. But at the end of the day, I think we can extract a lot from this story because it's not just American Airlines. Delta, they had 21 hour wait times when you were calling that airline this week. And United, they're having issues hiring baggage folks. Then you have the TSA offering $1,000 signing bonuses for anybody who signs up to be a TSA agent. I think the backdrop gives a very clear picture about what's going on with hiring in, this, in the United States. It's not easy. And so I think it comes all the way back to our discussions about the Fed, inflation, and labor inflation. When you have all these airlines, Delta, United, American Airlines, for me, it just paints a very clear picture. Yeah. If you look at the uh, TSA check put through rate, it absolutely plummeted during March and it just was barely grinding higher. And the, the airlines, we're barely holding on, and it's possible that you know they they perhaps they could have gone bankrupt if it were not 
for the uh, ample support from both the Federal Reserve as well as the U.S. government. I might point out that airlines is uh, one of the most dangerous and least profitable industries uh, that, that, yeah. that you will find. And you know, airlines frequently went bankrupt um, uh, up until, let's say, about, about five years ago. In fact, American Airlines went bankrupt in 2013. Um, I'll point out, Samuel, that uh, American Airlines was initially down on the day, trading on those negative he headlines that you talked about. Um, but it actually ended up up on the day because it was lifted by the short duration trade. And, and all the other airlines, uh, United, Southwest, Delta, were up. But I believe American Airlines uh, was, was up slightly less. Samuel, I have my own story, which is, you know, you've been doing your reporting, very factual. My story is a little more anecdotal, but it comes from my sister, who last night flew from California back to New York, and she was on a Delta flight, and her flight was oversold by 26 people. Now, overselling is a common tactic used by airlines because a less than 100% of people act, who buy tickets actually show up, but clearly they did that a little bit too much as they were basically bribing passengers with $800 Best Buy gift cards to stay in a hotel for free and, and get on a layaway because they overbooked by 26 people. So you're seeing that these supply shocks really are impacting the, the airlines. I guess the uh, $64,000 question, or maybe the $23 trillion question, uh, is just how widespread this is, uh, how much of this is a function of broader labor markets, and how much of this is a function of, for example, the rebound effect that we see in travel, uh, and perhaps just the dysfunctional uh, cartel that is the uh, U.S. airline industry. You were talking about bankruptcies. I remember uh, very clearly uh, being on a, uh, at the trading floor at uh, BB&T in, I think it was 2005, uh, and hearing one of the guys on the desk shriek, NWAC filed! And then 30 seconds later, in an increasingly shrill tone, Delta files! Delta files! And all the traders ran back because uh, you know, they had positions in those bonds. I mean, it, this is an industry that has been uh, fraught with peril, fraught with bankruptcies, uh, you know, dare I say, at times mismanaged uh, over the last uh, 20 plus years, and I'm sure far back beyond that before I was watching these markets. Well, and of all the government stimulus that came out as a result of the pandemic, there's one number that really stands out to me. There was one economist who calculated that the airlines had been given $1 billion too much if you look at where they were before and the money that they got and how they spent it. Of course, that will depend on who's doing the numbers, but uh, it was actually somebody who was in favor a lot of, of this stimulus coming to this conclusion. But at the end of the day, look, if you're wanting to invest in these companies, it's telling you one thing, there's certainly demand and not enough supply. You'd have to think that they're going to be able to get those pilots onto the right planes, that they'll get those employees trained up. So it does come back to this issue about will they be able to staff people at, at what price? You know, will they have to offer more in salary to people, more signing bonuses? And will that have an effect on how much the three of us and the people watching the daily briefing have to pay to get onto uh, an airplane? Yeah, you know, just, it's interesting, Samuel. The, uh, I believe American Airlines actually uh, has the majority of its operations or a disproportionate amount of its operations on domestic travel, which is essentially free to go. I mean, um, you know, maybe yeah. sitting on a certain seat, you, if, there, if it's less than full, you should you know, not sit directly next to someone. But it, there oh. essentially are... Oh, you guys have no idea in the United States how loose things are compared to here in Europe. Flying here is almost impossible, literally because of so much of the lockdown that we're still under here. But all the testing that has to go on, all the quarantining that has to go on, the day two, day five, day eight testing, once I get to the United States, it's free flying from there compared to all of the rules we live under here in Europe. Oh, yeah. Samuel, you know, you because, because you are in London. So, yeah, uh, in terms of strenuous, like the U.S. is here. And then within domestic Europe, between Europe, it's here. But international travel is, I think, an even higher bar. Yeah. Um, and if you oh, ever yeah. you know, go back to Arizona, you, you definitely will, will see that. So I, it's interesting to me that American Airlines is struggling, despite the fact that you know, it's sort of oriented towards a sector that should be, on a relative basis, succeeding. Domestic For sure. Challenge. I'm just relieved that as of this weekend, I no longer have to wear uh, a mask while I'm in the elevator in my apartment building. So that's uh, my benefit story. Hey, by the way, talking about international, I was just flipping through uh, some of the comments and I see Oliver Williams has just said, can we please use Sam joining the team to talk more about international markets? I suspect the answer to that question, Samuel, is yes. 
Absolutely. Well, on that note, inflation, we heard Christine Lagarde today say that she expects moderate inflation. She certainly didn't sound as nervous as some in the United States. But, you know, here in the UK, I've already said here on the daily briefing that because of Brexit, we'll feel some inflationary pressure because we don't have as many immigrants, although they were migrants because they were part of the EU before. So there's certainly some inflationary pressure here as well, but we don't have as much control of it. But certainly, we'll, we will be covering a lot more international stories. And uh, not just here. I spent a lot of time in Latin America, so expect to see a lot of that and a lot of uh, interest for me, as you've heard about uh, El Salvador moving to use Bitcoin. Fantastic. Talking of viewer comments, let's go to the questions because we're lighting up here uh, in our document. Uh, this one comes to us from Prius Omega, a regular viewer. Uh, I'm going to throw this one to Jack and Samuel dive in. Uh, what's the deal with the U.S. 10-year bonds, real yields, and gold? The inverse relationship is busted the last couple of trading days. Okay. Um, well, That's a really technical question. Yeah, No, no, I, I can handle it, Thank but you, I just think saying a correlation is busted for a few days. I think that correlations exist within regimes, and regimes do change, but I think that you have to give them a little weight. And I've actually run the correlation between uh, real rates and gold, real rates being inflation uh, adjusted. So you take the, the nominal rate, and then you in incorporate the, uh, what the market is pricing for inflation. That's called the inflation break-even. And it actually works pretty well. For example, one reason that gold essentially traded sideways over the past decade is that we had very muted inflation and inflation break even themselves were muted. So rates were you know, actually positive. Now they are deeply negative. Um, and that accelerated uh, into the beginning of this year, um, but they actually have risen slightly. Um, so I, I don't know if you can say that they have been busted because what I, I assume, um, you know, let's see, Rates surged and break evens declined. So, and yeah, okay, I, I see what he's saying, but I think you, you got to give it a little more time. Hey, Jack, can I just ask? That was a terrific technical answer to someone uh, who obviously has a very strong financial background in Prius Omega, and you yourself look at these uh, data sets every day. Let me ask you this, though, Jack. What did you just say for people who may be new to the bond markets and commodities? Give us the 50,000 foot overview, less technically. Okay. Um, I know it's a technical question, but give us the broad base. I like it. I like the way you're putting him on the spot, Ash. Yeah, yeah, I like <laughs> it. I, let's hope. Let's it hope says I something, by the way, that the harder question for Jack is to try and explain it in natural language. He understands the deep concept. Yeah. So let's see. So gold has no yield, right? Gold's not going to pay you a, a one percent dividend. It competes with the world of fixed income, which does pay you dividends. So if bonds pay you 3% and gold pays you nothing, that is a differential of 3%. So gold's maybe not looking so hot. But then you have to take into account inflation, which is what you're being paid in is being devalued. There's being a fiat devaluation, if I can use that that phrase. Um, so you know, it's not like you're being paid in something that is eternally fixed. You're, a nineteen dollar in 1970 is worth a lot less now. Um, so you can actually be paid in. You can still be losing money even if you're being paid if the the currency at which you're being paid is depreciating more rapidly than the rate of interest itself. So if rates are negative as they are now, the arguments oh, you shouldn't own gold because it has no yield, may not hold as much water because you're actually losing money even though you're being paid in interest when you, when you take into account inflation. Did I do an okay job? Check. Check. That was perfect. It's Very absolutely nice. Absolutely perfect. And it all comes back to inflation today on the daily briefing. Yes. Yeah. Here's a question that comes to us uh, from Lee. Uh, before BTC came to be, I was saying there would come a day when there would be a titanic struggle over the definition of money between central banks and the free market. Do you think this is beginning to play out? And can, in your opinion, governments stop the crypto juggernaut? Wow, this is a great question. Um, let me just jump in and take it. Um, the short, the the really short answer uh, is 
Yes, and probably not. Um, so to the questions, uh, you know, is there something that's happening uh, right now, this titanic struggle, as Lee phrases it, uh, about the definition of money uh, between central banks and the free market? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and we're seeing that, I think, increasingly uh, get exacerbated as central banks seem to consistently uh, fall perpetually further and further behind the curve in trying to manage their dual mandate. Um, what the uh, Ed Harrison uh, used to call the Scylla and Charybdis uh, in these markets. So I think that is definitely very much a reckoning. And, and part of the challenge, I think this is a very big uh, topic, obviously, but I, I would say in order to really understand it, you have to make this big topic even bigger, even broader. The reality is that we have real challenges uh, in Western democracies in particular, which are the markets that I follow most closely here in the United States. And that problem is political division. Uh, we have the greatest level of polarization that I've ever seen uh, in my life in this country. Uh, and so what that means is it's very challenging, whichever side of the political divide you come down on, uh, it's very challenging for the Congress of the United States uh, and to get stuff done. Uh, and what that means fundamentally is that if you have a Congress that's deeply hamstrung uh, by these partisan divisions, then the the kind of the kind of uh, sort of uh, blocking and tackling work of government becomes harder and harder for them to do. I have a friend who's a former New York Times reporter uh, who likes to say it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican when you're a mayor, uh, somebody's got to fix the potholes. And the reality is uh, there's this increasing sense that I have, again, totally nonpartisan statement, uh, that the potholes just aren't getting fixed. And what winds up happening uh, is that central banks then have to do progressively more and more of the heavy lifting. And there's a limitation uh, to what these central banks can do. Uh, you know, Central banks make great, uh, perhaps the, the, the metaphor might be firefighters. When there's a fire at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can pick up the phone uh, and call the central bank and they put it out. But they're not able to do the work of uh, building inspectors, making sure that buildings are up to code, making sure the economy is fundamentally sound. Uh, so this is a, a challenge that we are going to see uh, increasingly, I think, as we go and, forward in, in all and, and if you think there's a logjam in the United States, imagine what people in places like Venezuela are feeling. El Salvador, I'm not comparing El Salvador to Venezuela by any stretch of the imagination, but it's somewhere where government has been inefficient and gangs have taken over at times where government can't govern. So when you're in one of these places and you have the possibility of another currency that could be uh, more stable when you look at a place like Venezuela or that could make transactions between the United States and El Salvador easier, it certainly has, at the very least, a lot of appeal to broad was of the population. So forget about the potholes. The holes are much deeper in other places of the world that are really turning to crypto as a possibility at the very least. So, so many great points from you both. Uh, if, if I may just go back to the core of the question, what is money? If you read an economics textbook, what almost every single textbook will tell you is that money evolved as a more efficient way to conduct barter. So uh, Ash would make shoes, and Samuel, you would fish, and Ash, you would trade your shoes for Samuel's fish, and then gold coins sort of became a more efficient way to do that. I think uh, an increasingly large number of scholars, whether it's anthropologists, economists, or uh, numismatists, or who, people who study money, uh, actually think that it was money evolved as a way to cancel debt. And I think that Mike Green, actually, I believe, Ash, in a conversation with you earlier this year, put it, put it that way. Money is that which cancels debt. And I think there is no sh uh, shorter and more concise way to describe money than, than what Mike Green says. Money is that which cancels debt. And the original debt is taxes. Um, so if you can pay taxes in Bitcoin or in crypto, then it is money. And we see that El Salvador recently made those strides. So yeah, it definitely... Um, is something to that that is is currently evolving, and it would be very interesting to see how it uh, continues to evolve. And, and Boy, Jack, that's a wide swath from the double <laughs> coincident of want to uh, the foundational ideology of MMT. Yes, and, and just and just to circle back to a point that I was making earlier about the eurozone, I should say, uh, announcing a digital euro. I mean, I could really just hear them twisting themselves into what sounded like pretzels nearly, uh, <laughs> trying to explain how it would be anonymous, 
only if it were uh, under 75 euros, anything over 75 euros. I mean, you can really feel the way that there is unease from so many governments as what money is, is being redefined in some ways as a result of crypto. In spite of those long held definitions, there's a lot of competition in the marketplace. Yeah, I wrote a piece about a decade ago when I was a reporter at CNBC uh, about the Eurozone uh, and the European Union. And I think the headline was something like, forget too big to fail, uh, is the EU or EZ too complicated to succeed? Ooh, mm, good point. By the way, speaking of too complicated to succeed, I wanted to just circle back to the end of Lee's question, because this was a really interesting point, And it's something that I'm actually a little bit out of consensus on, and it's a bit of a controversial take that I have on this, which is unusual for me. Uh, and the question is, do you think uh, that, in my opinion, governments can stop the crypto juggernaut. Uh, I think, in the short term, it's very unlikely that they can. However, and this is an out-of-consensus opinion, I really do believe uh, that it is possible for, for, na for large, powerful nation-states uh, to begin to put significant pressure uh, on cryptocurrency. There's this phrase uh, that gets bandied about a lot in the crypto space, which is that Bitcoin is unstoppable. It's totally uncensorable. And I think that's true using today's technology, uh, but you can imagine a future, whether it's five or 10 years uh, ahead, where there was embedded hardware uh, that was specifically intended uh, to censor, impede, report, analyze uh, what's happening in networks. Now, this is a very controversial opinion and certainly probably beyond the scope of uh, today's conversation. But I really do believe that, that, that nation states, particularly a coordinated action uh, by supranational organizations and nation states, actually has the potential uh, to restrict, uh, if not, um, just let's just let's say it in the most general sense, to restrict the flow of cryptocurrency. But when we look at the story out of China today, I mean, you brought up the point about the directives that places like Alipay are getting. I mean, let's say, just a, a theoretical, Ash, that China completely stops all interaction, outlaws any interaction uh, with any type of cryptocurrency. Do you think that that would stop crypto? I have a feeling you would say no, but wouldn't it dent the industry so much? And I mean the industry when I say the industry without a juggernaut like China. Yeah, I think that's exactly the right question, Samuel. This question of what can be, uh, what happens, what's the impact uh, if there are these draconian uh, sort of laws that could potentially uh, restrict the flow of Bitcoin by outlawing it. And I think that China is certainly the nation that is best positioned to do so. Obviously, we know that they have uh, considerable control uh, at the main access points uh, for the internet. They have the so-called Great Firewall of China, which is able to, for example, restrict uh, Western social media websites from being served to their uh, billion-plus population. So it's certainly possible that China uh, has the technology, uh, perhaps the will and the central control uh, to be able to, at very least, begin to impede the flow of it. And as you say, dent the industry. That would be a major uh, hit to price. Would it recover? I think it's likely that it would. I don't think that the technology exists today in 2021 to shut down uh, the Bitcoin network. In fact, the network itself is probably uh, nearly impossible to stop. Uh, but you could severely restrict the on-ramps and the off-ramps, which would have a significant impact, precisely as you suggest, Samuel, uh, on price and on the industry more broadly. Yeah, I mean, it's still Go you ahead, Jack. You know a lot more about the technology than I do, but I would agree it, it is functionally impossible to shut down the network in that Bitcoin can exist in that, Ash, you, 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 I can go over to your house and give you a hard drive, and then you can give me you know, currency. But are hedge fund managers going to be plowing into this thing if you know, one of the largest economies on Earth, China, bans it outright? Probably not. So I think Bitcoin, as we know it, can be shut down, but Bitcoin as a network cannot be shut down. I agree. I agree with you, uh, Jack, in what you said about your your fundamental view of of the way that the network works. I don't know. I think hedge fund managers might be interested in continuing to invest in it. Look at a price. Uh, there's probably a bid for it. I I don't know that China leaving the ecosystem uh, in and of itself uh, would be enough to uh, to sort of decimate the price. I think it would be certainly. Uh, uh, a bearish sign for the industry, but I don't. I don't think it would be enough for institutional investors to want to back away from it. What would be enough for institutional investors to want to move away from it would be significant or draconian legislation in the U.S., in Europe, 
that would restrict uh, or uh, begin to look as though it was uh, moving or making inroads uh, toward outright prohibition. But I, I just don't foresee that happening. And I just have to say that when you look at something as decentralized as Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies at large, and we look at China, which is arguably the most centralized unit in the entire world, it's just very hard for me to see how the two go ahead together, crypto and China. When you look at the mm -hmm. amount of control, I mean, you just talked about it online, but when you can look at the amount of control they exert over people using those online tools, especially in a post-COVID era, we're not quite there yet, but we'll get there, in a post-COVID era, the type of draconian measures they've used to track people and to really put that apparatus more in place, the type of control that China has over its people, that centralized nature that it has over its people at current time, it just slaps in the face of Bitcoin. So I have a very hard time seeing how those two move forward together. Yeah, well said, and probably a good note to end it. Gentlemen, we appear to have run over time once again on the show. Shocking. I'm sure none of our viewers will believe it happened once again. Any final thoughts? Jack, first to you. Uh, well, I my, my final thought would be, I wonder if global central banks and global governments would prove less hostile to other forms of cryptocurrency, such as Ethereum, that maybe uh, are a little more friendly, less decentralized than they would with, with Bitcoin. Because to sort of go back to my anthropological argument, I don't think governments want digital value being stored in a temple that can be locked away. I think they want it in circulation being used to fund the projects. And something like Ethereum or, or other coins um, may be more friendly to that. I know that's, that's a very, you know, that's very yeah. uh, provoking thoughts. So I, it's not really much of a closing thought, but uh, yeah. Well, China already has DCEP, the Digital Currency Electronic Payment Network, which is a highly centralized uh, cryptocurrency-like uh, central bank product coming out of PBOC. Uh, so I expect we'll probably see more of that uh, in the months and years to come. Samuel, to you, final thoughts. Well, I'm just going to go back to what billionaire investor Ray Dalio signaled today in that conference in Qatar. And he just said that there is so much liquidity in the market that it's really put everything out of whack from him, to put it simply. And so when I look at a day like today, when you have the Fed presidents from Dallas to St. Louis, former Treasury, Treasury Secretary uh, Larry Summers and Ray Dalio all saying that this is a uh, uh, that they're hawkish uh, about the situation with inflation, moving away from transitory comments. When you have that and the market has the day that it did today, it really makes you wonder, uh, not wonder, it really makes you think about those comments from Ray Dalio and how he sees liquidity in this market. Yeah, yeah. all eyes on the CPI next month. Absolutely. And all eyes on liquidity. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks, Ash. Good evening from London.